The Beechcraft Barons are not strangers to improper loading. They have a narrow CG range at full gross, and loading variables may provide a pilot an opportunity to enter an illegal flight. Many times, the pilot may not be aware of the transgression. Unfortunately, when the airplane encounters a condition of flight approaching the outside of the design standards, the sudden discovery may be catastrophic. The accident report will carry weight and balance as the secondary cause. This problem is real enough that many pilots have been advised to carry a 50-pound bag of sand in the baggage compartment. We think a simple loading schedule may be a better solution. This tape has two sections. The first, a preview of the mysteries of weight and balance by Dr. Wellman, then a pilot operating handbook study of the method used by Beach Aircraft for arriving at the proper loading of a Baron. We will offer a method for constructing a simple graph for a loading schedule that will enable a Baron pilot to decide quickly and easily if planned loading will be within the approved envelope. When was the last time you gave any thought to such phrases as mean aerodynamic cord, datum, arm, limit load. Hello, my name is Jack Wellman. I'm Director of Program Development for Airmanship Incorporated, the knowledge center for today's pilot. And in this presentation, we'll be talking about weight and balance, and we'll be using those terms. As you progress through this presentation on weight and balance, you'll probably have a few moments of confusion and doubt. Remind yourself that others before you had to figure similar problems without the assistance of the FAA to define terms or the aeronautical engineers to set the limits for you or airmanship to put it all together in living color. By the time you finish this presentation, you will rediscover the meanings of the following terms. Maximum takeoff weight. Empty weight. Zero fuel weight. Basic operating weight, useful load, maximum ramp or taxi weight, center of gravity, fuel load, mean aerodynamic cord, moment index, datum, arm, moment, limit load, and ultimate load. We will review the concepts of aircraft stability, how the center of gravity limits are determined, and the consequences of an out-of-balance aircraft. First, deal with weight. Your plane will have designated for it two important weight figures. These are the empty weight and the maximum takeoff weight, sometimes referred to as the maximum gross weight. The empty weight consists of the airframe, engines, and all items of operating equipment that have fixed locations and are permanently installed in the aircraft. It includes optional and special equipment, fixed ballast, hydraulic fluid, fuel and undrainable residual fuel and oil. When oil is used for propeller feathering, it's included. Maximum takeoff weight is the maximum allowable weight at the start of the takeoff run. Some aircraft are approved for loading a greater weight, ramp or taxi weight, only to allow for fuel burn-off during ground operation. The takeoff weight for a particular flight may be limited to a lesser weight when runway length, atmospheric conditions, or other variables are adverse. Useful load is the weight of the pilot, co-pilot, passengers, baggage, and uh, usable fuel. It is the empty weight subtracted from the maximum allowable takeoff weight. Some aircraft which have a high fuel burn rate are allowed to load heavier than the maximum takeoff weight. The difference between the ramp or taxi weight and the maximum takeoff weight is the fuel which the crew estimates that the airplane will burn during taxi and runup. Other aircraft also have a maximum landing weight listed in their operating manuals. This is the maximum weight at which the aircraft may be normally landed. The maximum landing weight may be limited to a lesser weight when runway length or atmospheric conditions dictate. Within the FAA glossary of terms are two more weight definition. Basic operating weight, the aircraft.
aircraft, including the crew, ready for flight, but without payload and fuel. The other term is maximum allowable zero fuel. It is the maximum allowable weight authorized for the aircraft, not including the fuel load. Zero fuel weight for each particular flight is the operating weight plus the payload. These two terms would be most applicable in the charter and freight divisions of general aviation. Among some pilots, there is an erroneous impression that the maximum takeoff weight is the limit that a plane can lift off the ground. While this may be true under certain conditions of density altitude, it is not the basic reason for a maximum takeoff weight. This limit is determined primarily on the basis of the aircraft's structural design. The wing will only support so much weight. As an example, the FAA requires that all aircraft under 4,000 pounds in normal category must have a minimum limit load factor of 3.8 Gs. The limit load is that factor which an aircraft can repeatedly encounter without creating any structural damage. However, the stressing of an aircraft goes far beyond the limit load. Most general aviation aircraft are designed to accept a force 50% greater than the limit load for one occasion without structural failure occurring. This load factor is called the ultimate load. Between the limit load and the ultimate load, Structural damage may probably occur in some form, but the aircraft will not come unglued in one single incident. A chart displayed here is commonly referred to as a VN diagram. On the grid, load factors are represented by horizontal lines and indicated airspeed in miles per hour by the vertical. The area enclosed by dotted lines is what you might call the operating envelope for the aircraft. Radiating out from 1G on the left margin are lines representing gust forces in feet per second. Note that above the 1G line, these gust forces are positive. These positive and negative gusts are related to the attitude of the airplane. On our diagram, we have used colors to illustrate the relationship of this diagram to your airspeed indicator. Point A is the minimum speed at which 1G can be maintained and is established as the stall speed. Lines C, E, and I, G represent the limit load. Structural damage may occur in any area of the diagram which is shaded gray. Maneuvering speed for this plane is located at point C. The curved portion of the dotted line is essentially a continuation of the level stall speed found at point A. Air speeds less than that at point C cannot produce loads capable of damaging the aircraft. Well, let's suppose that you flew into some turbulence which called for reduced air speed. You reduce your speed to 100 miles per hour. Suddenly you are hit by an up gust of uh, 30 feet per second. Look at the chart where the 100 miles per hour and the 30 feet per second gust lines cross. The point is outside the operating envelope, meaning, meaning that under those conditions, you would stall. Sticking with the maneuvering speed for your aircraft will assure you of not meeting the limit load while keeping you away from the danger of an inadvertent stall. An aircraft with a maximum takeoff weight of 3,500 pounds will have a limit load of 13,300 pounds based on a factor of 3.8. Now, on a cool day, you could probably get the plane off the ground with a 500-pound overload. However, if you were to hit an up gust, which put a 3.8 g-force on your plane, you would be forcing it to accept a full ton more of weight at that instance than it was designed to take. A post-flight inspection should be conducted to locate any wrinkled skin or popped rivets. Repeatedly subjecting your plane to this type of stress may even cause catastrophic failure to occur on some occasion before the ultimate load factor is reached. A negative limit load factor is also designated for all aircraft. It is usually a smaller number except for aerobatic aircraft. 
other than down gusts, most aircraft do not receive many really heavy negative G-forces, student landings being, a, being the exception, of course. Weight or gravity is one of the four forces acting upon an aircraft in flight. Lift must be greater than weight for an aircraft to get off the ground and fly. The greater the weight, the greater the lift must be to support the plane. If you are forced to produce more lift to support the additional weight, you must also be forced to produce more induced drag. In order to overcome additional drag, you must increase thrust or power. What all this means is that what your airplane weighs on a particular flight will determine to a great degree how much fuel you are going to use. It will affect takeoff performance, cruise, and landing performance. A pilot with an eye towards efficiency will keep his plane as light as possible within the realm of safety. Let us return to a statement we made a few minutes ago concerning maximum takeoff weight. We stated that the maximum takeoff weight was determined by the limit load factor rather than the capability of lifting a certain load off the ground. It is also a fact that there may be atmospheric conditions present which would prevent your plane from getting off the ground even with a load considerably less than the maximum takeoff weight. You know these conditions by the term density altitude. In another tape, we will discuss takeoff performance. But we would like to remind you that conditions of temperature, humidity, altitude, and air pressure must be considered carefully before any takeoff in a fully loaded aircraft. In fact, FAR 91.5 requires that you check all these conditions. It is possible that in several models of general aviation aircraft with all seats filled, baggage at capacity, and full tanks, the maximum takeoff weight may be exceeded. One reason for this is that the FAA has a schedule of standard weights which the aircraft companies use in computing useful loads. The standard weight of a general aviation passenger is given to be 170 pounds. Well, it's easy to see that an aircraft designed to carry six 170 pounders with full fuel and baggage could be well over gross if you loaded in six 200 pound fishing companions without offloading some fuel or fishing gear. This information may be useful on the occasion that you want to offload your mother-in-law and put her on an airliner. Also, no two aircraft of the same model will have the same empty weight or useful load. However, all aircraft of the same model will retain maximum takeoff weight. The reason is each aircraft begins a customizing process as soon as it's delivered to its first owner. Each addition or subtraction of equipment, each modification, requires that a mechanic revise the weight and balance records of that particular aircraft. Failure to comply with this requirement just once will throw off all the subsequent weight and balance revisions with perhaps tragic results at some point in the future. Because an aircraft is controlled aerodynamically in flight, we'll take a few minutes to review some of the basic principles of flight. The stability of your aircraft is most affected by the way you balance it. In a general sense, an airplane which is stable will tend to return to its normal attitude unaided after it has been nudged from that attitude by some external force. For example, if you're cruising in straight and level, relatively calm air, a small up gust causes the nose of the plane to pitch up, and a few more pitch oscillations of diminishing intensity will occur until you are once again riding in smooth level flight. Your aircraft is designed so it has stability in all three axes, roll, pitch, and yaw. When you first look at the diagram of the four forces acting on an aircraft in flight, the diagram probably showed them with lift and weight opposite each other and thrust and drag in opposition. In practice, this is not exactly so. If we discount the download from the horizontal tail surface, most aircraft are designed so that the center of gravity is actually ahead of the center of pressure, sometimes called the center of lift. The line of thrust is also usually slightly above the line of drag along the longitudinal axis. The offsetting of
this creates a situation where the aircraft has a natural tendency to pitch nose down under certain flight conditions. To counter this nose down tendency, the horizontal tail is set at an angle of incidence which will produce negative lift, a down force. In level cruise flight, at maximum gross weight, your plane should be flying with little or no trim because the horizontal stabilizer is producing just enough negative lift to counter the nose down tendency of the two offsetting forces. When an up gust shoves the nose up, the angle of attack of the stabilizer lessens and may even go from negative to positive. This causes a reduction in the negative lift of the stabilizer. At this point, the center of gravity ahead of the aerodynamic center will cause the nose to pitch down. After a few seconds of down pitch, the horizontal stabilizer will regain enough negative lift to push the tail down and the nose back up. The pitching oscillations will each diminish in intensity until the tail is once again in balance with the center of gravity. An aircraft which can do this is said to have both static and dynamic stability. Now, let us suppose that in loading your plane with fuel, passengers, and baggage, you have, removed this, you have moved the center of gravity beyond the forward limit. The horizontal tail is probably in a fixed angle of incidence and therefore will always produce the same negative lift at maximum gross and level cruise. Since you have moved the center of gravity ahead of the center of lift, you must do something to counter the additional downforce of the nose. You do this by using some up elevator. As the center of gravity is moved further forward, you will at some point reach full up elevator in attempting to control the down pitching nose. Beyond that point, no additional aerodynamic control is available and your plane will continue to dive until it hits the ground. Now in order to assure you a full aerodynamic pitch control at all air speeds, the forward center of gravity will be placed at a point which will assure sufficient elevator deflection at minimum air speeds. Let's change the situation to a takeoff. The maximum downforce from the stabilizer with full elevator deflection is low because the velocity of the relative wind is low. It is possible that the airspeed attained during takeoff will not develop enough aerodynamic pressure with full up elevator to get the nose wheel off in the span of, say, the typical general aviation airport. Landing with an extreme forward center of gravity could cause a loss of control at a critical time. With relative wind slowing and ground effect diminishing the effectiveness of the stabilizer and elevator, you could just simply nose down into the runway out of control. The manufacturer of your aircraft determined the forward center of gravity primarily on the basis of adequate elevator effectiveness at slow flight speeds. Keeping the CG behind the forward limit will guarantee you of up elevator effectiveness. Now the rear center of gravity limit is based on another concept related to positive stability, meaning the tendency for your plane to return to its trimmed attitude. Your plane has positive stability when it returns unaided to its original attitude. It has neutral stability when it does not return to trim flight but keeps going in the direction to which it was deflected. If the nose is bumped up, the plane will keep going until it stalls. If bumped down, it will dive until it hits the ground. You will be able to control situations of neutral stability. However, a plane with neutral stability will not handle as easily as the one you're accustomed to. In order to get the same thing done, you will have to exert more control force and as a result have a tendency to over control the plane. How do you keep your plane from becoming neutrally stable? Always make sure that your center of gravity is ahead of the aft limit. Is there such a thing as negative stability? There certainly is. And from the pilot's point of view, it's the worst kind. The center of gravity is behind the center of lift and there is no tendency for the nose to pitch down. Imagine a power off stall with the center of gravity behind the rear limit. With positive stability, your plane will pitch down to the due to the location of the CG. Under negative stability, the tail heavy craft will tend to increase the pitch up and exaggerate the stall. The action will probably be followed by a spin, possibly a flat spin, from which no recovery technique will work. A few years ago, the FAA General Aviation News published a story about a pilot who lost an airplane 
literally. He was, he was flying a small, two-place, low-wing retractable over the farmlands of the Midwest. Suddenly, the engine seized and wrenched itself right from the mounts and fell to the ground. The pilot found himself in one of those hypothetical situations which just doesn't happen. The center of gravity was out of sight behind him. Fortunately, nothing else was damaged and his airspeed was at a high cruise. He no longer had a need for a hand on the throttle, so he put both hands on the wheel and forced it forward. He had enough airspeed to make it work and he dove the little bird to the ground at orbital velocity. His flare consisted of a slight relaxation of forward pressure on the controls. The plane bellied into a bean field at a speed greater than his normal cruise. The pilot survived. The plane survived. The engine survived. And all were reunited in about nine while flying once again. This is one of only a few recorded examples of a successful landing with the CG displaced so far to the rear. Most of the time, the results of a tail-heavy loading just leave a mess for someone on the ground to clean up. Negative stability is the worst possible condition you can deliberately place on your plane. Your aircraft is designed to fly with positive stability. You can assure yourself of it staying that way by observing the limits when loading. Now, let's review the consequences of loading an aircraft beyond the limits of the center of gravity envelope. A center of gravity ahead of the limits will, one, produce excessive stability requiring increased control wheel forces. Two, it will also increase stalling speeds. And three, decrease performance. A center of gravity too far aft may, one, reduce control wheel forces with the potential for pilot over controlling, two, change stall characteristics from benign to violent, and three, develop a tendency for a normal spin to become a flat spin. Most concern for balance is centered on controlling pitch along the longitudinal axis. Yaw along the lateral axis also must possess stability but since loading only affects it indirectly, we will not discuss it further in this presentation. Roll along the vertical axis must also have positive stability. Since most planes have wing tanks and some have nacelle baggage compartments, we'll take a brief look at loading the wings. Most of the optional loading of wings occurs close to the fuselage. It is doubtful that unbalanced loads there will cause much more than a heavy wing, which must be held up either with trim or muscle power. Tip tanks add another. If you fly a plane with tip tanks, fuel management is a necessity. As with elevators, aileron deflection must be dis limited by design. Full deflection at slow air speeds may not give you the adequate roll control when tip tank weights are grossly disproportionate. Most aircraft have only one center of gravity envelope developed for them. It is for the longitudinal plane or pitch control. The forward limit is set by the elevator effectiveness at slow airspeeds, while the aft limit is determined so that the aircraft will always have positive stability. In most general aviation aircraft, this envelope is measured in just a few inches of lateral distance. Understanding how to determine the center of gravity for a particular loading situation we requires us to review a few terms. The datum is an imaginary vertical plane or line established by the manufacturer from which all measurements of arm or distance are taken. The permissible center of gravity range is measured from the datum in inches. An arm is the horizontal distance in inches from the reference datum to the center of gravity of a particular item. The mathematical sign plus is used for arms located after the datum. A minus sign is used for an item which is placed forward of the datum. Moment is the product of the weight in pounds of an item multiplied by its arm in inches. Moments are expressed in pound inches. Total moment is the weight of the aircraft multiplied by the distance between the datum and the center of gravity. The fuel load is the expendable part of the aircraft load. It includes only usable fuel, not fuel required to fill the lines or that which remains trapped in the tank sump. Gasoline weighs six pounds per gallon. Kerosene weighs six 
6.7 pounds per gallon, and lubricating oil weighs 7.5 pounds per gallon. A station is a location in the aircraft which is identified by a number designating its distance in inches from the datum. The datum is, therefore, identified as station zero. The station and arm are usually identical. An item located at station plus 50 would have an arm of 50 inches. The term percent of mean aerodynamic cord, long phrase, is used by some manufacturers to show the limits of the center of gravity. Mean aerodynamic cord is a hypothetical cord line running parallel to the longitudinal axis and is located through the geographical center of the wing. Aircraft manufacturers use several kinds of graphs and charts from which the weight and balance of their aircraft may be calculated. They are all based on what is referred to as the computational method. We will help you with the traditional graphs and tables only in this presentation. One should watch this presentation before beginning to build a master for another airplane. After watching it, it will be necessary to collect the necessary materials specific to the individual airplane. When the material is organized and the tape is presented, using the pause button on the VCR will provide an opportunity to relate the information on the hypothetical airplane to the actual airplane. You will need to secure the current empty weight for the airplane and the charts and graphs from its handbook. The moment limits versus weight chart, the useful load weights, and moments charts for occupants, the chart for baggage loading, the chart for fuel loading, and the moment limits versus weight graph that will be the template for the matter. We suggest that the graphs and tables be enlarged 8.5 by 11 inch page with several copies made. This will provide more accuracy when these charts are used. The enlarged takeoff weight graph from the performance section of the, the POH should be mounted on the back side of the completed moment versus weight master for future use. We will discuss this graph fully in a later tape. The complete master loading schedule and the takeoff weight chart may be encased in either a lamination or a sheet protector. If keeping a complete trip record for each flight is useful, 100 loose leaf copies of the master can replace the lamination. A small clear plastic straight edge, a good ink pen, and a pen with erasable ink will be useful for establishing intersection points in the construction of and use of the completed master in flight operations. Beach aircraft tables and graphs remove most of the calculation phase of schedule preparation. We will use these to construct a master that gives a pictorial representation of the loading condition. Following is easy and requires very little arithmetic to operate. The principle is quite simple. At any given station, any weight increases gives a corresponding moment increase. Weight and moment buildup follows a slope peculiar to that station. We will create reference lines each with its own slope for each station. When a line parallel to the reference line from one station is joined at a specific weight point on the parallel line of another station, the new line will lead to a new center of gravity when the desired new weight increases is reached. The basic operating weight in our model that includes the pilot and navigation gear totaling 200 pounds is a constant. All other adjustments may be made by extending or retracting the reference lines if weight deviates from standard. The planning should begin with the occupants being added, then the baggage, and finally the fuel. The primary margin for error with this method lies in the accuracy of the original construction. Our model has broad lines and large dots for camera visibility. The working master should have narrow, well-placed lines and small dots. If the final graph reading raises questions about accuracy on a loading, it should be quickly checked against the tables. To begin the master, the basic empty weight must be current and correct. For our example, we will use a hypothetical 58 with a 3,700 pound empty weight and a 5,500 pounds maximum gross weight. 
with that information, one turns to the weight limit versus moment table and reads down the weight column to the proper empty weight. The next two columns opposite represents a forward and aft loading possibility. Reading down the forward limit column, we find that this weight has a 2,738 forward limit. The aft limit is 3,182. We will interpolate this to 2960. Turning to the moment versus weight graph and reading up the right side, we find the 3,700 pound horizontal line and hold it while we find the 2,900 and 3,000 diagonal moment line. Between those two, 2960 can be found and we hold this line with our straight edge and run down the intersection with 3,700 pounds. It is necessary to place a dot here to flag this point to define a line we will draw. We will mark this intersection with a dot. Following the slope of the moment lines to the bottom of the graph, we read less than 80 inches in the bottom scale. We are near the center of the envelope that is an ideal position for the empty weight. Next, we will prepare a scheduled loading, the passengers first. Air carriers may use 180 pounds per passenger and baggage on a 40-60 mix of male and female for their loading schedules. If they are carrying a professional football team or soldiers loaded with combat gear, this may be altered to fit the occasion. We believe that the 170 pound standard adopted by general aviation is satisfactory except when unusual situations arise. For this illustration, we are loading a club seating configuration, but the charts will conform to any scheduled sanctioned by beach. Turning to the occupant loading tables, we decide that we will load the pilot at 200 pounds to take care of navigational equipment and the co-pilot and all other passengers at 170 pounds. The weight column is on the far left of the tables. Reading across to the right, we find provisions for four seating possibilities. We will concern ourselves with the front seats for the pilot and co-pilot, the third and fourth aft facing seats, and the club seating in the rear. Possible cargo loading with the seats removed will require another complete calculation. If this becomes necessary, be aware of the floor loading limitation. Reading across from the 200 pound weight, we find that for the front seats, the moment is 150 forward and 164 aft. Interpolating, we select 155. Back to our graph, we add the 200 pounds to the 3,700 pound empty weight and establish 3,900 pounds as the basic operating weight. Adding the 155 moment to the 2960, we arrive at 3115 as the new moment and place another dot at the intersection. The dot we place at this intersection marks the basic operating weight or bow and will be the point of origination of all future schedules since we must always have the pilot on board. The co-pilot's 170 pounds and the interpolated moment of 133 added gives us another intersection requiring a dot. When this is completed, we have loaded the forward seats or crew stations. If we have done our work properly, the three dots connected will form a straight line. We can move on to the aft facing and the club seats and repeat the loading process for each. When we have completed, we will have three straight lines connecting seven dots. Unfortunately, the last passenger has placed the airplane out of CG before we have completed loading. We may have to decide to offload this passenger. Hopefully, our schedule will let us avoid this. We must examine the impact of baggage loading on our problem. To do this, we need baggage reference lines. First, a check should be made of the current 337 form to be sure that no equipment has been installed in the baggage areas that would reduce allowable baggage. To prepare the lines, 
let's turn to our baggage loading tables. We note that the 300 allowable pounds in the nose only increases the moment by 45. For our master, we have set the baggage reference lines off the loading plot, but within the envelope to illustrate the point that moving the straight edge parallel to the reference line will enable us to find a new CG without further calculation. We have anchored our model at the intersection of 3,500 pounds and a moment of 2,800. We rise to a moment increase of 2,845 and at the intersection of 3,800 pounds we place a dot. Connect the two points and we have a reference line for nose baggage. You may anchor the starting points for these reference lines at a place that seems most convenient for your operation. Repeating the process for 120 pounds and a 216 moment increase for the aft baggage will complete the two baggage lines. Note that the slopes are in different directions and that it requires a great deal of weight to have much impact on the nose moment. With the addition of the fuel reference line, we will have completed our master. The fuel offers the most simple concept in the weight and balance standard for the Baron. For our master, we will assume that we may carry 194 gallons weighing 1,164 pounds, and the fuel table tells us this will give a moment increase of 974. This permits us to graph a vertical rise that is only slightly biased to aft loading. We have assembled all the reference lines in our master and have them labeled for instructional purposes. The reference points are easified visually, and many people refer to use this master without the labels. That should be a judgment call of the pilot. Now we may address the problem we have found in our practice loading. Obviously, we must load weight forward. Loading 300 pounds in the nose may be a solution. We find the intersection of the 300 pound increase in weight and the 45 increase in moment and draw a connecting line to the last intersection point, representing the maximum weight for occupants. If there is no desire to use the full 300 pounds, one may take off any desired weight on the line to mark the next departure point. This holds true of any of the reference lines plotted. The 300 pounds in the nose gives us a satisfactory CG range, but we would like to load 120 pounds in the aft baggage compartment. Using the straight edge again, we move the completed reference line from the aft baggage plot up to anchor on the high point of the actual nose baggage line. Rotating it to parallel the reference line will lead to an end point at the 120 pound weight increase line. This brings us to 5,170 pounds if we have used the full 300 pounds in the nose baggage compartment. We have a satisfactory CG range at a zero fuel weight condition. The allowable fuel of 55 gallons plus 4 gallons for start and taxi, our model 58 is still in CG range, but may be subject to environment before we load the full 5,500 pounds. Another scenario might be a pilot and co-pilot flying metal castings to a satellite plant. They arrive at the airport to find 300 pounds mistakenly loaded in the nose. A quick application of the straight edge anchor on the co-pilot's position rising 300 pounds reveals that the trip is legal until fuel is loaded, then it is far out of limits. Some weight must be added to or moved to the aft portion of the airplane. The pilot decides to take 120 pounds from the nose and move it to the aft baggage compartment. To do this, he will go up the nose baggage line and establish a new anchor point at the 180 pound increase point. He then rotates to parallel the aft baggage line and rises 120 pounds as found on the right side of scale. We need draw no more lines. The visual presentation is clear. We can load fuel to full tanks of 5,534 pounds allowing for start and taxi and have a 10 pound overgross condition at takeoff. It should be noted that overloads this small have been mentioned in accident reports. 
Many flights will be conducted with fuel load rather than passenger load being the primary concern. We suggest that for those flights, a second master be constructed if the graph only requires a single fuel reference line. The line can anchor on the basic operating weight and further evaluation can begin from the top of the desired fuel load. If this chart is to be used, the two masters may be placed back to back inside a sheet protector or lamination. A pilot using the graph will find it necessary to be aware of the takeoff weight limitations taken from the appropriate chart. This is important enough that it may be advisable to lay down a horizontal line marking the new maximum weight rather than depending on dot placement alone. This will ensure a more accurate loading. We have developed a master schedule for hypothetical 58 that we can use as a permanent record in any actual flight program. The procedure we use to develop it will work for any baron. Loading on the different model barons varies a great deal depending on center of gravity limitations and performance under different conditions. Although the layout looks different on this sample 55 model, the principles are the same. This model offers several possibilities for improper loading and one must use a proper graph to create the master. You will note that we have placed the nose baggage reference line in the primary schedule after fitting four seats. It may be necessary to employ this station frequently, especially if a fifth seat is filled. Loading should also consider the fact that the main auxiliary tanks lines on this model have different slopes. Auxiliary tanks will have a bad effect on aft CG near the limit while the mains will help this condition. This may play an important part in the total fuel load requiring less fuel on board than hoped for. The Baron fuel systems requires careful monitoring to always be certain of total fuel on board. A number of accidents each year attest to this type of oversight. An envelope for the P Baron also looks different because of the additional weight and accommodations required for the turbocharger installation. Proper weight and balance is particularly important on this model. Takeoff and landing weights and zero fuel weight should be considered for every flight. Each of these is a direct reflection of structural integrity. Although many Baron flights are conducted each day without reference to proper loading, FAA considers it important enough to require a permanent schedule for revenue flights. In the event of an accident, it will determine quickly if the envelope has been broached, and insurance companies may be happy to make the owner very happy at settlement time. In normal operations, a pilot will encounter many situations that will require more than an eyeball analysis to ensure proper loading. 60 seconds with a scheduling master may be time well spent. When a pilot becomes familiar with the schedule, it will only be necessary to enter the anchor dots in erasable ink on the plastic sheet and let the straight edge alone lead to the final center of gravity. Beginning at total weight for the occupant stations in most cases is either for calculations for baggage and fuel. Management of weight in the Baron is a very important ingredient in safety of flight. We hope this very functional tool will increase safety in your Baron. Well, this presentation on weight and balance has taken us through some of the following concepts. Aircraft stability center of gravity envelope, the hazards of loading an aircraft either too far forward or too far aft, reasons for the center of gravity limits. We also reviewed the following terms, datum, arm, moment, empty weight, maximum takeoff weight, maximum gross weight, useful load, maximum ramp or taxi weight, center of gravity, fuel load, moment index. The total fore and aft movement of the center of gravity for most general aviation in aircraft is limited to a few inches. For example, a Beechcraft Baron A55 allows for 14 inches between aft limits when the aircraft is light. 
but only 6.6 .6 inches when it is at maximum growth. The Cessna Skyhawk allows for an envelope of only about 20 inches at maximum growth. It should be clear from this discussion that careless loading of any aircraft from an ultralight to a 747 can create problems for the pilot from which there may be little or no chance to recover. Large numbers of flights are conducted each day with one or two persons on board and only a briefcase and a map case for baggage. The need to calculate weight and balance is remote in these situations, especially when the atmosphere is near standard. However, when the loading of your aircraft involves weight at each station, bulky baggage, cargo, or a gross weight approaching maximum allowable, take the extra few minutes necessary to calculate your weight and balance. It's not only safer, but proper arrangement of weight could save you a few dollars in fuel costs and may get you to your destination a little sooner. We believe you know the consequence for failure to recognize and deal with weight and balance in your aircraft. We hope that this airmanship presentation will bring you greater safety and more pleasure to you as you fly.